so I've actually got an eye beacon attached to my cat. Ruby is alive, Ruby's not going in. Oh, I want to dream for developer happiness. I'm Ben. Hello, everybody. Um, and today I'm going to talk about Ruby. Yeah. yeah. Well, I will if it's. Oh, gosh. What's going on here? Wow. Woohoo. <laughs> I love Israel. Woohoo. <laughs> yeah. It's great to be back here. Um, yeah. So when I was invited back this year, of course, I jumped straight at the chance. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I love Israel. But more than Israel, more than I love Israel, I love Raphael. <laughs> He's my friend. He's a really cool guy. And if you know Raphael, uh, if you know about Raphael, you'll know that um, he's a fairly fluid kind of guy. He's, uh, yeah, disorganized, maybe. Um, this is the geological time scale. Um, this is when you ask Raphael if we can go for dinner. Um, somewhere down there at the bottom of the paleogenic uh, era. <laughs> you know, time passes by, continents are formed, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, ages, uh, like peoples come and go. And then, you know, this is when you actually go for dinner, several billion years later. Um, so this is where our hotel is, um, and you know, we were going out for dinner the other night, and uh, this is the route we could have took to dinner. <laughs> this is the route we did take to dinner. Um, yeah, he likes to walk <laughs> aimlessly, <laughs> forever. <laughs> we all lost weight, yeah. I guess that's one good uh, side effect of, of this. But anyway, there is, a, there is a serious slant to my talk today. I'm going to talk about Ruby. So, of course, I'm guessing a few of you are Rubyists in the audience. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, the good side of the, of the audience. Was that intentional? Because nobody over this side said they were Rubyists. So, I mean, I know Eric's a Rubyist, right? Anyone over this side? Okay, you were just tired, I guess. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about Ruby. And there's a lot of people saying at the moment that Ruby's dead. This is a quote from the internet. Um, <clears throat> from somebody called Cynical Person, which I thought was a strange name. <sighs> More quotes, you know, announcing the death or the imminent death of Ruby. Five languages marked for death, Ruby being one of them. Dice.com, you know, the last bastion of great internet journalism. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> oh, it makes Matt so sad to hear this. And Matt's is such a nice guy, you know. He, he, I threw up on him and he came and he kind of, you know, cleaned my face, cleaned my beard, patted me on the back and told me that I'd never work in Ruby again. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, Rouse is dead. It's this opinionated person again. They're back. <sighs> is Rouse dead? I don't know. Is Ruby on Rouse dying? Somebody who calls themselves "I like kill nerds" makes no sense to me. Maybe it makes sense to you. I'm not sure. And you know, this kind of makes. Uh, I'm sure this makes my. Remote control stopped working. Ah, this makes DHH sad. This is DHH being sad in his million dollar car. I don't know if you can see him there, he's actually crying. Um, he's really sad in his million dollar car. Oh, and behind him is his other million dollar car. DHH is really sad and he really cares what you think about Rouse because it affects him. This is DHH being really sad winning Le Mans. You can't see it, but inside, he's dying. Poor guy. 
Yeah. <laughs> DHH is sad. Oh, too late. The smart people have already left Ruby. Hacker news jerk. I didn't catch this guy's name. Maybe you know him. And I'm here to say that is a ball. And that's shit. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> I don't believe this. I don't believe Ruby's dying. I don't believe Rousey's dying, and I'm going to tell you why. But let's ask the question again. Is Ruby dead? Hmm. No, I don't think so. And it would be easy for me to say at this juncture, <laughs> thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? But unfortunately for you, I do need to fill some airtime. So I'm going to do that with a loosely related collection of trolls and memes, um, which if you know me, uh, you'll probably be used to by now. Um, so, I could have, um, I could have told you why Ruby isn't dead, and I could have blinded you with statistics, and science, and graphs, and stuff, but that's bullshit to me. Um, I don't understand any of those things. Um, so this is going to be the last graph you see today, so take it in. That's uh, Javier Bardem's hair factor. And you see on the one axis, we have the quality of hair. And on the other axis, we have the critical reception. Yeah. Skyfall wasn't a particularly good time for, his, for Javier Bardem's hair. I think you'll agree. Anyway. So, a little bit about me. I work for the English government. Yeah. I'm not a spy. Um, it's probably worth saying, so I can see some military folks here. I'm not a spy. I'm really not a spy. So, I'm going to say though, when I'm not around the uh, Israeli military, um, I do tend to kind of say I am a spy. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pretend I'm, I'm this kind of suave, sophisticated guy. When in actual fact, that's, that's me. I'm kind of as nerdy as you get, really. <laughs> but one of the interesting things is, when you, um, you know, when you go to work for the English government, um, there's this small governmental department called GCHQ, which is uh, very secretive and know everything about you and they need to look into your past and you need to get something called security clearance. So when they sent me all of these forms, you know, I'm there, I'm filling out all of these forms and I'm, I'm kind of putting all this personal information on there. And to be fair, I was kind of worried. I was kind of worried because I've got some really shady shit in my past. I used to work for Microsoft. <laughs> yes, they found that out. Anyway, let's get back on track. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a very, very brief history of Ruby. Let's start, shall we? And in between these uh, historic points in time, I'm going to uh, intersperse with some pictures of me at that age. So in 1993, Ruby is born. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> 13 years old. I, you, you'll see I did grow into the ears and the teeth eventually. Uh, the hair's kind of fabulous, I think you'll agree. <laughs> 1996, Ruby hit 1.0. So there was a per brief period of time between the kind of inception of Ruby, if you like, and uh, when Ruby stabilised. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. And then 2001, the pickaxe book came along, which is kind of like one of the very defining moments in the history of Ruby. Um, you know, people started to become aware of Ruby outside of Japan. People were using Ruby. People were starting to build things in Ruby. Um, and then we get to 2003, and Ruby 1.8 comes around. And at this stage, Ruby's really starting to gather pace. And then we get to towards the end of 2003, and there's another fairly defining event. Oh gosh, Ruby Gems, Ruby Gems appears. And obviously 2003 for me was a particularly strange year. Um, I am wearing a melon on my head. 
Okay. But also there was another uh, event in 2003. So the seas parted. Biblical shit happened. And Rattles was born. Hooray. And that's why we're here today, right? So Rattles was born. Um, Rattles is the killer app for Ruby. So this is Matt's quote. Matt's is saying this. So the killer app, you know. So you may, maybe you've heard of this phrase before. So generally what it means is, you know, you get like a video games console when they say, you know, Super Mario Brothers is the killer app for the Nintendo. Uh, it's something that really popularized that, that particular uh, gaming system. So, and so Rails really popularized Ruby. And I don't know if you remember the whole, the, the DHH blog in 15 minutes. I don't know if many of you are kind of fairly new Rubyists or did anyone see this video back in the day? And it's all, yeah, whoops. Look at all the code I'm not writing, whoops. Look at all the million dollar cars I am driving. <laughs> he didn't know that then. He didn't know he was going to be rich. Bless him. <sighs> okay. And Rails was optimized for developer happiness, just as Ruby was. And there was this real kind of uh, deep uh, symbiosis, if you like. And there's absolutely, and I honestly believe this, there's simply no better framework for building Basecamp. <laughs> <laughs> There really isn't. <laughs> so yeah, as I mentioned, there's this symbiosis. You know, so symbiosis is this kind of uh, naturally occurring thing where two, I guess, unrelated species um, coexist and help each other in certain ways. And there's certain types of symbiosis. You know, so not all symbiosis is good. All right. So here you see the shark and the small fish thing swimming along in the slipstream of the shark. And there's mutualism and commensalism and parasitism. And the question is, you know, what, how do we class Rails and how do we class Ruby? So, of course, you know, some people would say that Ruby wouldn't be what it is today without Rails. We just wouldn't know about Ruby. Rails was the killer app for Ruby for, for the longest time. I mean, sure, some of you might remember things like Merb. And, of course, there was a time when Merb was um, merged with Rails. And for a lot of people, that was uh, uh, quite a sad time. Um, and some people decried the, the kind of death of, uh, of Rails, or certainly the death of Merb, of course, because it was kind of subsumed by Rails. But anyway, and also there's this whole uh, kind of bus factor. So I don't know if you've heard of this before, but um, the bus factor is, the, the, is a kind of measurement, a metric for teams, that if uh, how many of your team members would need to be run over by a bus to cause a really drastic situation to occur. And some people say the bus factor of Ruby is one, thanks to Rails. So if Rails was to crawl into the corner and die tomorrow, where would that leave Ruby? Who knows? Probably not in a good place, perhaps. So has there been a failure to innovate as well lately with Rails? Um, what has Rails brought us lately? Um, there's TurboLinks, which we all know and love, uh, to turn off in our gem files. <laughs> Does anyone use TurboLinks? Have we got any fans of TurboLinks in the audience? Really? Can you... The exit's over there. If you'd like to uh, pick up your things and, and, and leave, that would be great. Thank you. Quietly. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So we've got the asset pipeline. There's a typo there, sorry. Um, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I guess my uh, autocorrect wasn't working. Or perhaps it was working. <laughs> yeah. We've got action cable. I mean, come on now. What the hell is even action cable? I mean, action cable has, like, celluloid and a vent machine. <laughs> because, you know... <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to introduce concurrency, so they introduced concurrency for their concurrency frameworks, <laughs> which is just, it's just brilliant, brilliant news. If one fails over, you, you get the other. 
So, you know, it's easy at this stage, you know, I'm beating up on rows, and it's easy to be a, a hypocrite, and it's easy to poke fun at rows, and, you know, scumbag Steve, you know, hates rows, but yet makes a living from building rows apps, which is true, certainly in, the, in my case. So I'm not going to beat up on rows all day long, just for a little bit longer. Oh, gosh, there's me. Um, okay. So how do we improve rows? Like, what, you know... Do, or do we even care? Is, it, is, it, is the time ripe for another framework to come in and, and uh, drink Rouse's milk or eat Rouse's lunch? I'm not sure. My controller is really lame. Yeah, is it time for Rouse to grow up? Is it time for Rouse to stop trying to um, introduce these perhaps needless features, underused features, uh, features that are clearly invented to uh, support Basecamp and Basecamp's use cases. Um, is it time for Rails to introduce features that make Rails apps more maintainable over the long term? Um, you know, I, I'm guessing a few of you here work on long-term Rails applications, Rails applications that have been around for a good while, maybe longer than two years. Rails cope, yeah. Three years, four years. So most of the people who said four years plus have got no hair, which is probably a good, <laughs> is a real good benchmark. I mean, I work, I work on code bases. I work on one Rails code base that's eight years old. Yeah, it really is. It makes you question your life's decisions every time you open your editor. Um, but of course, the Ruby community uh, is characterized by our you know, belief and our love of the alternative. Um, most of us even style ourselves, our appearances alternatively, as you're seeing now. And there's a world of alternatives in the Ruby community. And you know, there's no need to be kind of shoehorning the same old crap into our Rails applications. There are alternatives out there. There are people out there that are really making lots of effort to try and, and, and give some structure beyond the kind of, you know, the app directory, the controllers directory, the models directory, to try and give our applications, our Rails applications, some new layers of perhaps indirection, but more abstractions and more ways to, uh, more ways to write more maintainable code and testable code indeed. So then we've got my buddy Nick here, who's uh, who wrote the the Trailbra Trailblazer uh, collection of gems. So this is kind of like a loosely uh, uh, loosely related collection of gems, which just adds some more structure to our Rails applications. Does anybody use any of this guy's code? Reform. Not heard of Reform before. You, yeah, there's a few of you. Yeah. He's got a book, by the way. Um, I don't know if you can see it up there. There's me on the cover. It's not the most flattering picture <laughs> of my hairline, I'm, I'm going to say. Uh, there's also the Lotus framework. So Lotus is a, is a really cool framework, a uh, fairly new framework. Still very much in its infancy, uh, but starting to gain some traction. Uh, I've worked on a production application that uses Lotus. Has anybody here used Lotus? Nobody. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> so Lotus has this attitude, uh, you know, we, the, the kind of standard attitude with Rails applications is to build like, kind of monolith first, and this is one of the things that I believe is missing in traditional Rails, is this kind of path to separation. So when your Rails applications get really big and murky, um, like this big emoji poop, um, what do you do? How do you split them up into microservices, um, which you may have seen are many smaller poops? Um, closely related. And yeah, so there's Luca. Uh, Luca's a really great guy, really friendly, really welcoming, and he's trying to do his best to introduce some sanity to the Ruby world. And of course, you know, there's alternatives in the kind of uh, the, the, the kind of ORM layer as well. Uh, most people here, I'm going to say, probably just use Active Record. Maybe some of you have heard of Data Mapper and uh, more lately uh, ROM, uh, which appears to have been rewritten about a thousand times. Uh, but I'm assured that the latest rewrite is actually going to be stable and, and go 1.0 soon enough. Um, there's the author of ROM. And, you know, you have to give a lot of love to these people that are really trying to uh, inject some 
uh, interest and passion and some new ideas, bring some new ideas to the Ruby community. But, you know, this guy, he's there and he's still as cynical as ever and he's saying that it's too late. The smart people have, have already left the Ruby community. I don't think that's true. So, as I asked before, or as I said, or as I stated before, the Ruby community is about alternatives and, you know, I'm going to ask who's actually used any of these frameworks in production. One, two, okay, maybe three or four, okay, just a few, just a few. So maybe, the, the, maybe I'll go back and edit that slide the next time I give this talk and I'll just say the Ruby community is collectively uh, Rails fans. <laughs> but also, so we get this whole idea about, uh, or the difference between the actual language and the runtime. So in 2002, we missed a fairly significant event, at least in my mind anyway. So it was the birth of JRuby all that way back. Um, I wasn't actually uh, part of the Ruby community back then. Um, so I wasn't aware that JRuby was kind of, the, the project was founded all the way back then. So JRuby didn't actually run Rails or didn't run the Rails test suite until 2006. So there was quite a passing of time between the kind of inception of, of JRuby and when it stabilized and when it became uh, able to run Rails, which I guess is kind of the defining moment for any interpreter. And you know, let's talk about innovation. Let's talk about how these projects, how these interpreters innovate. Well, I mean, you know, JRuby runs on a JVM, so it's going to take uh, or you know, use a lot of the power uh, provided to it by the JVM. JVM being probably one of the kind of finest um, virtual machines uh, around today. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the JVM. There's languages like Clojure and uh, Scala and various other things that, that, that are running on the JVM that are very popular languages. And let's flip the switch and talk about Ruby 2.3. So if we're talking about innovation and we're talking about interpreters, you know, what has Ruby 2.3 brought to the table recently? Um, you know, some of you may have seen the news that Ruby 2.3 is, is, is fairly close. So you've got this kind of safe navigation thing, which is kind of, you know, the, the, the moment this was announced, it was kind of, you, you heard collectively a, a, a million people scream out in pain. Um, <laughs> You know, if things like try, you know, this, this active supports try is probably the biggest code smell ever released into the wild. Uh, and I'm convinced was actually like a real uh, long troll by DHH. Uh, you know, this has recently changed to and dot, which you might change to and why bother. Um, there's some people that say, you know, why, don't, why doesn't Ruby just kind of go the whole hog and take everything that's introduced in active support and just make it a first class uh, language citizen? Well, yeah, I guess so, you know. And you've got these uh, new additions that nobody's probably ever going to use as well. Like, and let's talk about the Ruby standard library. Um, it's a wasteland. <laughs> It's a wasteland of you know varying quality, and I know I'm not going to steal um, Sergio's thunder. Sergio's going to give us a talk about the Ruby standard library, um, the gemification of the standard library. So there was some efforts recently to try and gemify the standard library. So to break the release cycle of the standard library and the, and the core library from the release cycle of the interpreter of MRI itself, you know, so we can. Um, fix bugs on less than a, a yearly release cycle or perhaps you know less than a, a six month release cycle and also just to break those things apart and allow regular people to come in and try and maintain and try and clean up and try and introduce some sanity to the standard library and Rubinius um, went a long way with this so Rubinius actually broke out the standard library into gems um, but unfortunately for, for us and the rest of the world, nobody uses Rubinius, <laughs> which is a real shame. <laughs> but there is some good stuff in uh, Ruby 2.3, thanks to Eric. And again, you know, Eric's going to give us a, a talk about that later. Um, this was pretty cool. Um, 
Yeah, so you know, we need to thank Eric for that. So anybody that uses OpenStruct, um, which is, I guess, lots of us in our code bases, uh, it's a fairly cool part of the standard library and something that's kind of been fairly dusty since the inception of uh, Ruby. But again, as I say, I'll let Eric speak about that later. So yeah, so innovation. So is where is the innovation occurring? Where are the new features being added to Ruby? How is Ruby um, staying up to date with the wants and the needs of the kind of modern application developer, if you like? So the landscape has changed underneath Ruby uh, in the last few years. You know, Moore's law kicked in, so clock speeds that didn't get any faster. And more cores were being added to chips. And how do we take advantage of that as Rubyists? Well, you know, at the moment, we just throw processes at the, at the problem. You know, how do we get concurrency? How do we take advantage of these systems that we're running our code on? And of course, we have Rubinius. You know, there's the alternative interpreters, as we've said. So, you know, how is Rubinius innovating? What did, what did Rubinius do for the Ruby community? Well, one thing that r was brilliant that came out of the Rubinius project was the RubySpec project, which you may have heard of. So the RubySpec project is something, is, a, is, is basically a suite of tests that go some way to defining the behavior of the Ruby language itself and the Ruby standard library. So you may know that Ruby itself uh, as a language is, is unspecified or is specified using the ISO specification, but only up to, I believe, 1.8 specification. Ruby itself doesn't have a formal specification. So of course for people trying to introduce or people trying to offer new interpreters um, to follow uh, what is potentially undefined or you know loosely defined behavior, it's a moving target. It's really tricky. So the Ruby spec project was, was really great in that regard. So I'm going to ask, has anybody actually deployed systems, production systems in JRuby? Oh, good. So there's a few of you. So has anybody deployed production systems with Rubinius? Of course you haven't. <laughs> it's a real shame, you know, when there's like been literally tens of thousands of hours put into these systems and, and they just don't get any use. So there's interpreters everywhere. You know, it doesn't end there. there there's many, many more. There's Elixir. Any fans of Elixir? Yeah, of course there are. Elixir's brilliant. I know we've got to talk about Elixir coming up later on as well. So we've got Ruby Motion, which is absolutely fantastic. So I've, I've uh, built applications uh, using Ruby Motion, iOS applications using Ruby Motion. Um, you can even build Android apps using Ruby Motion. Um, there's, of course, Opal. You know, there's some really cool stuff going on in our community. There's Opal, which turns your Ruby to JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> it turns Ruby to JavaScript. Oh. <laughs> they do. I'm guessing, like, if somebody ever tries to write a JavaScript to Ruby, uh, can, uh, is there a JavaScript to Ruby bridge? I'm sure there is. I mean, in, just in these last two seconds alone, a thousand JavaScript frameworks were born <laughs> and died. <laughs> We've got Vault as well, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's Crystal, so I saw a brilliant talk from Eric uh, earlier this year at a conference about Crystal. Uh, Crystal being, you know, a, a fairly simple drop-in replacement for Ruby. Uh, most Ruby just runs as is on Crystal, and Crystal is uh, has bindings for C code, Ruby-inspired syntax. I encourage you to take a look at it, it seems really cool, and it's gathering a lot of speed. Um, so, you know, as a, let's just say, as an ana analogy, if you're a carpenter, you know, you don't just have a box, a, a toolbox full of hammers, you, know, you have a varied tool set, and one of the important things is to know when and, and which tool is best for the job. And it's the same for us, with our interpreters and with our frameworks, and it's about knowing and being polyglot, and knowing how best to use our tool set. And you know, we should really support these projects. We should try and support these projects, whether that means we uh, just download them, install them, try and you know, hack on some interesting stuff. We try and translate gems. We try and, um, you know, one of the really simple things you can do is just get 
uh, your projects building against these interpreters? So perhaps in Travis, you know, it's easy enough in, in your build matrix in Travis just to add JRuby or just to add Rubinius and just to add Ruby uh, head um, and report back these failures and raise bugs and, and use these things. Um, and of course, you know, Docker makes that really easy these days as well. Um, I did try and propose a, a new uh, logo for the to the Docker people. Um, I know somebody who works for Docker. They didn't really see the funny side of this. But this is actually most people's experience with Docker. Um, this is how Docker, this is really the experience with Docker, yeah. And this is us there trying to get Docker to work. And this is Docker trying to kill us <laughs> with its big tail. <sighs> okay. So we're getting near the end now, you'd be glad to know. So let's talk about ownership. So ownership of the language. So this is one of the big problems uh, for me. So, of course, the ownership of the Ruby language and the direction of the, the Ruby language is very much based around Matt's. And, you know, so it should be. So Matt's was the original creator of the Ruby language, and he's our benevolent dictator. But, you know, that, that kind of causes a problem for us. Um, there's the alternative in interpreters, you know, so the things like JRuby the, the, and the uh, Rubiniuses of the world and the crystals of the world, you know, these guys that, and, and girls that are involved in these projects that are spending, you know, inordinate amounts of time and effort trying to make Ruby a better place and then just kind of being completely banjaxed by um, Matt's and the MRI core team. You know, there was this time when there was a, a kind of regular meetup of... Um, people that worked on the Ruby interpreters. They'd get together, they'd kind of discuss the future of Ruby, you know, where they were going with features and try and reach upon some kind of common ground. And unfortunately that, that, that broke apart after a short time and I believe hasn't happened for, for, uh, for a while now. And it's a shame and it's gonna hurt all of us. And one of the other big problems with Ruby at the moment is our reliance on open source infrastructure. So, you know, right up until recent times, things like Bundler and, you know, the real kind of core infrastructure, the real core projects and um, components that we use in our everyday uh, writing Ruby code um, were completely uh, open source, of course. Um, and the infrastructure themselves, you know, that, that it wasn't funded by any particular body and, you know, any kind of commercial element. And it's a real problem for us. And then, of course, we've got this issue now with um, people kind of rage quitting open source, you know, people getting burnt out from open source. So people spending real kind of, you know, inordinate amounts of time and effort, personal time and effort, in uh, maintaining and, and releasing and, and, you know, developing open source systems that we all rely on in our day-to-day -day work. You know, we, have, we work for businesses that make millions of dollars uh, running these people's code. And what do we contribute back to these projects? You know, and not just from a fiscal perspective as well, not from a financial perspective, but actually just from a kind of, you know, everyday uh, in, uh, pr project involvement and, you know, if we hit a problem in these systems, in these open source projects, do we raise bugs or do we just go on Hacker News and whine about it? I'm going to say the latter most of the time, unfortunately. Um, and this is a really interesting quote to me. So there's this, the, the Ruby Together organization was brought about, I believe it's a, a, a charitable organization that was brought about and has a kind of steering group and you can, um, donate money to these people and you can become part of this steering group and you can vote on where this money is distributed. And there's people like, uh, I believe it's Andre Arco, you know, somebody that spent a lot of time making Bundler great. Um, you know, a lot of personal time making Bundler great. And, and people like that are now being funded to work on these real core critical infrastructure projects full time, which is brilliant for us. And I would encourage you to, if you've not um, donated money to this, uh, to do that if you've got a business that makes money using these pieces of infrastructure, then I believe that, that you owe it to yourselves and to the rest of the community to do that. And one of the other problems, of course, at the moment is uh, with the getting fresh uh, talent into the pipeline. So, 
you know, looking around the room now, if it, this is kind of a fairly characteristic crowd of people that, that you would see out in the workplace and people in the open source community working on projects. It's important to us to try and introduce and encourage and bring new talent into the pipeline. So we're getting fresh ideas and fresh talent. And in summary, Ruby is alive. I do believe Ruby is alive. Ruby's not going anywhere soon. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how Ruby does evolve over the next few years and whether the um, maintainers of the other interpreters are going to get as, as big a say in the direction of Ruby, uh, how Ruby grows into this kind of more concurrent landscape that we're in nowadays, what features Ruby is going to add for concurrency, and whether we ever get to a situation where Ruby can drop the uh, global interpreter lock, which is a big problem for us. And you know, maybe it's not uh, Ruby that's dead, maybe it was us all along. <laughs> <laughs> so let's explore and support the alternatives in the Ruby community. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs>